Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben, and in this episode of the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast, we're chatting with Brad Shorten, pitmaster and spice rub blender, bringing delicious, authentic barbecue to Sydney through his restaurant Fire and Brimstone Barbecue, which has been nominated for the ABA Award for Restaurant of the Year. This is the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast with your host, Ben Arnott. How long has it been since your last confession? Brad, it's been a while, mate. It's been a long time since we last chatted. Good to see you again. Good to see you, Ben. Thanks for thanks for the invite. I'm, I'm really excited to do this. Mate, I know that you are flat out, so I really appreciate you taking time to, uh, to to talk to me today. And I can see that you've actually locked yourself in the karaoke booth in your restaurant, so you'd have somewhere <laughs> quiet to talk to me. So I really do appreciate it. Yeah, I was looking for a spot. I'm like, where am I going to do this? Every little spot I could find, I'm like, nah, there's someone, there's someone. I'm like, oh, karaoke booth air conditioned inside, away from the heat. Let's do it. Yeah, that's a win all round, buddy, a win all round. So, look, congratulations on the nomination for the uh, Australasian Barbecue Alliance Restaurant of the Year Award, man. That's huge. Thank you. Yeah, it was uh, very, very surprising. I just, uh, when it popped up, someone that works sent me a link, and I'm like, what? Like, I look at the names on that list and just can't believe that I'm even, you know, in the same realm to be nominated beside them, you know? So, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, very, very happy and, uh, yeah, excited. Yeah, it's a it's a hell of an achievement even just to be nominated. So the I I don't know if they've uh, filled you in on it, but the way that it it, it works is that um, it started off as a public vote. So you've obviously got a lot of supporters behind you who who put your name forward, and then it goes to a peer group to the awards committee. And so you know okay. of the of the thirty names or forty names, whatever it was that was nominated, we then sort of weed that down to the to the top eight. So it's not only yeah, a popular yeah, yeah, vote. Yeah. It's then a a peer reviewed shortlist. So yeah. uh Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't hundred percent sure how it was done. I'm like I, I remember the the public vote going before Christmas, I think it was, and I saw the post, I'm like, Yeah, sweet, you know, someone mentioned my name, I'm like, great, you know, I'm I'm excited this for this to get nominated that way. Uh and then yeah, I was just like I saw it was peer and I'm like, I don't really know who's voting or how this works, but you know. I know that the boys at the ABA or boys and girls, but um do everything you know, amazingly well and they know what they're doing. So, yeah. So, can't wait. I'm ho- hopefully going to head up to Toowoomba and be there on the night just to enjoy it. So, that's the plan at the moment. Mate, that'd be great to see you there. Yeah. So, sink a few beers and, and, and just have a good night and see all these ba- barbecue people that, you know, some of them haven't seen in, in ages, you know, from around, the, around different parts of Australia. So, uh, it'd be good to catch up with a lot of them. Yeah, that has been one thing we've had to adjust to in the last couple of years. We've gone from, you know, ev- everybody seeing each other every couple of weeks to, yep. you know, I mean, it's been two or three years since I've seen you now. So it's, yeah, um, yeah. it's, uh, it's, st- it's, it's good that we're able to get together when we can. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And, you know, that's what barbecue is, isn't it? It's about getting together and enjoying yourself and family and friends. And that's what it is. So. You're exactly right, man. You're exactly right. Now, uh, mentioning family, let's get into the uh, into the barbecue chat side of things. Given yep. that you own a restaurant and a rub and sauce arm of that uh, of that business, do you actually cook and eat barbecue at home? Not as much as I used to. Uh, so one thing that makes it difficult in my house is my wife's vegetarian. So oh. <laughs> barbecue is not going to be a, a big part of that. Um, and to be honest, that's probably where the restaurant came from. The fact of when I first got into it, because I cook brisket and there's no one there to eat it with me. So I take it to friends and that, and that's where it went. Oh, you can do this half all right. Can you make more? Can you make more? It's exploded. So, um, but at home, pretty much what I'll do, because I live with my brother-in-law as well. He's a chef. So he likes the whole fire side of cooking. So we tend to muck around more with live fire at the moment, more direct fire at home. So, and hanging different things over fire pits is sort of what we've muck around with and steaks and things like that. Um, so not a lot of low and slow at home. One is time. So when I am home, I don't really want to be sitting there just all day because I do it all day at work. Um, yes, yeah, so that's the majority of it now is at home is, is live fire. So like I hung, I we did a few ducks the other night over live fire as something different to see one or see how it goes, you know, and uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing stuff. Yeah, right. So tell us a bit more about those ducks. How'd you go about doing them? Yeah, so we picked up a couple of ducks from a place here in Sydney Fresh uh, and just sort of, I've got a fire pit with a tripod over it that hangs a grill like it goes up and down. I thought I took the grill off and 
we sort of cut the hooks in it and hung the duck sort of sort of direct but indirect sort of an idea and then um made up just a, a bit of a spice rub just a few things we had in the cupboard a bit of a sauce and just kept basting it and until it was cooked like you know it was no real didn't know how long it was going to take it was like, i would keep doing it and doing it and doing it and and uh yeah a couple of hours later it took and my brother and i were like yeah this is pretty awesome so now i'm trying to work out how i can bring that to the restaurant uh, i've got a few ideas but i'm not really sure how we're going to do it yet so Okay, fire and brimstones, hanging duck. That sounds delicious. Why not? Yeah. yeah, yeah. What What were you basting that uh, that bird with? Um, it was a bit of a, like a soy sauce sort of hoisin, um, and a bit of honey and stuff like that. Uh, it was more, that was more my brother-in-law being the he's a chef uh, at a steakhouse in the city, and he's always mucking around with the different like Asian flavors and stuff. And he's like, "Yeah, just make this up." And I'm like, "Yeah, we'll see how it goes." And um, yeah, it was it was pretty epic. Yeah, that sounds delicious, and I, I I love that you're um you know you're that you're able to share that with your brother in law. You just mentioned a couple of minutes ago the barbecue is all about family, and for you it literally yeah. really really is all about family. Yeah, yeah, because we both work in food, so and we like very like he's in a steakhouse and does stuff in that, but he's done fine dining. So and I got barbecue, and it's like it's food, it's still hospitality, but it's so different for each other. So like we sort of learn off each other and do things like that and it's just yeah it's always good to sit around the fire and away we go yeah right cool and so what then would be your your favorite thing to barbecue at home um chicken i do a lot i like i like the like i use the tomato um for that and um like direct as well so direct over charcoal um it's nice and fast that's probably my go-to at home it's, it's you know it's quick fast easy and goes out um at home, but yeah. Okay, so you're not getting in there and doing all the whole, you know, scraping the scraping the skin for the chicken thigh competition practice and all that sort of stuff? No. That's one thing I do not miss over the last couple of years of, um, of not competing is, is doing that. Like, I can just remember having, like, a day here in the restaurant leading up to a comp, and I spent half the day doing that. I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing that. So <laughs> it's, it's one job I, I could outsource if I could, you know. Oh, mate chicken skins i uh I, I remember one competition i was at I'd, I'd i'd never heard of doing it before and i walked past uh another competitor's tent and i saw them doing it i said what are you guys doing and they explained what they were doing and I, in my head i just went not a chance there's no, no way i'm doing that so no way <laughs> we did we've done it and done it and i'm just like i've got to work out a better way and it doesn't matter what i try it never works so i'm just like i keep going back to it you know, there's times where I bought in like a box of chicken skins just to try and practice on and do that. I'm like, yeah, that's yeah, nah. Too many other things to do to worry about that. So you can buy boxes of just chicken skins. Yeah. So our butcher back then, when I first started competing, he's like, um, yeah, you just get them in. I get the bag of chicken skins, like this is where they're taking them off the thighs from another order, I suppose, and just yeah. And then I can find bigger pieces. So then, way you know, sometimes I buy a thigh. And you, you offer the skin on, and then by the time you take it off, there's no skin. Like it's just, it's been cut that small that doesn't fit anyway. So I'm like, yep, yeah, sweet. I'll just grab another piece that's, you know, bigger and I can trim it down to size. Wow. Okay. So aside from from competition practice and, and preparation, what else would, would people do with a box of chicken skins? Um, well, I've seen different places like they use, like the fat is really good. Like you scrape it off and use it on that, like um, flavor wise, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, but I've seen, I, like, I've seen places online and stuff where you're like, they fry them up and like little crackle and you know chicken skins. It's like it's with a bit of salt. I reckon you can make a nice chip out of it. So. Oh, okay, interesting. I've I've never heard of that before. I love learning new yeah. things. Every, every time I sit and talk to somebody, I learn new things. I, I haven't tried it myself, but I have seen it and like it. Yeah, that sounds pretty uh, interesting idea. Yeah, fantastic. Now. You've got a um a barbecue restaurant now. You make rubs, you make sauces. Let's go back in time. Where did barbecue all start for you? So growing up, I've always always been around barbecue and, and cooking and things like that. Like my dad, while he wasn't much of a cook, uh, as such you know, yeah, <laughs> we always had a barbecue. Like he, it took me years to get him to not eat well done steak. So that's the idea of what he used to do. Um, but even as a young, we used to go bush a lot and go camping and, and hunting and stuff. So there was always a fire and things like that. So I was always interested in it. And then as I got older, I'm like, you know what? I want to be a chef. I want to work in a restaurant. And then it's just like, um, yeah, I'm getting into it. And I just never really found a spot. So I just, 
just sort of gave up on that idea and didn't do it. And always had a barbecue and thing like that. And then for one day, my wife like, I come home in a present. She got me she got, yeah, a roadside Weber um, quite a few years ago, which is, yeah, as I said before, she's vegetarian. So by her buying me a barbecue is a bit of a, an interesting idea. Um, so yeah, I started with that and I'm like, oh, this is pretty good. You know, I enjoy this. And I'm, I'm the sort of person that it's just a, a few times in my life where I've gone, found a bit of a hobby and then turned it into a job. So I just did that and started cooking and cooking and then said, yeah, take it to work. So I used to work at a car rental company and I'd take a brisket in there and feed the people for lunch because what else am I going to do? Like I could never eat it all. And that was it. And then they were sort of like, yeah, cool. Can I get one this weekend? I've got a party. And then one brisket a, a, a fortnight cooking for myself turned into seven, eight, ten a week. I'm like, how am I going to keep up? So I had to upgrade barbecues. And that's how where it all started for me. Like the really from just cooking at home to enjoying it. So hang on, I'm going to make it, try and make a career out of this. Yeah, right. So I sort of went from that. And I'm like, all right. And then I uh, met Adam. So Adam Wizards of You. Uh, we hooked up and did a barbecue team before Wizards of Q, actually. We had a comp, uh, Meat Stock Sydney, and um, did all right. And then we decided to start catering together. So I was still working at my other job. So I do 60 hour weeks there as a, as a car rental. And I'd cook all night and he'd do the party the next day. And just somehow we made it work. And then from there, that's when the restaurant came up idea. They went, You want to open a restaurant? I wanted to, I was so keen, like, you know, because it all happened so fast. Um, but I was in a job that I do already want to take a risk. You know, restaurants are tough. Like I've never had one, but I'm like, I know how many fail and stuff like that. And yeah. They can convince me, let's do it. And my wife said, they're okay. And went, let's give it a go and see what happens. And, you know, four weeks at, in what, two weeks time, the restaurant's been open for four years. So um, it's, it's gone through very fast and it's, it's been a whirlwind and, and it's an amazing ride. And, I don't know where it's going to end up, but I'm, I'm still enjoying it. I'm loving life. So, Yeah, well, when the stats are something like, what is it, 90% of restaurants fold within 12 months or something, like to be Some, still here after like four that. years, yeah. you, you're doing something very yeah. right. Yeah, so, yeah, it's been good. Like the, the support of the, the people in Sydney has been amazing. And, yeah, so, I, you know, I didn't know how it was going to go that first that first six months was just, or well, first 12 months was, like I've never worked so hard in my life. Like it's the longest days, the longest, but yeah, it was worth it. Just seeing the people's faces, you know, you, you feed them some food and they look at you like, how did you do this? Like, yeah, like, you know, that's what pushed me through those. So. And you just go magic. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> it's like people go, so how long did you cook that for? And I'm like, I don't know. Mate. Like it's, it went on about then. It's going to come off about there. Like I, I've got time wise. I don't really know anymore. It's about me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which is yeah, the hardest thing to explain to people. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Look, I'd, I'd, I want to loop back to something that you said before. Um, you said that you grew up uh, camping and, and hunting. What was your favourite yes. thing to, to, to hunt and cook when you were out camping? Um, so I was quite young, um, like, you know, sort of, like I remember from about 8, 10 years old to about 16. Um, the main thing, like, hunting and eating and cooking, and, and it was goats mainly. Like, it was the first thing we'd ever go. Wherever we'd go, That'd be like the first, like especially in the areas we're hunting. Like we might have been chasing rabbits, foxes, or, you know, pigs and things like that. But it was always a goat. Yeah, cool. Find you that right size goat, and that was the the meat for the next couple of days. So that was like all my dads and all those guys. That's what I did. It was always that first thing was a goat, and um, yeah, that was always yeah. It was, that's where it started for me. Yeah. Right. Okay. So it kind of started in 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 game cooking. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. And then. So what would you say has been the, uh, the wildest thing that you've, uh, oh, sorry, that's a bit of a poor, poor choice of words there. <laughs> What's been the, um, the, the most exotic wild animal that you've uh, hunted and cooked and eaten? Um, oh, see, not much too much because for me, like we did like goat pigs were the main things um, that we sort of cooked and ate. So it wasn't really out there. Like my dad, like I was just too young. Like he used to go and do buffalo. He's done buffalo, killed and eaten camel. Wow. Um, throughout through and um, deer is one thing I chased. Um, I don't think I was ever quiet enough to shoot deer. We did this all with bow and arrows too, so it wasn't like sitting with oh. a gun from a long way away. Uh, everything was close. So yeah, so deer was one thing I always wanted, and I never got the chance to. Uh, yeah, that would have been pretty cool. I've eaten plenty of deer that my family has shot and eaten and then killed, but not not done myself. Yeah, right. I think uh, 
I think bows and arrows are far more sporting than uh, than than it's, rifle shooting. It, it's a lot harder. You got to be a lot closer, and a lot wider. Mm. Yeah, no doubt about that at all. I I grew up on a farm, and I used to, uh, as a teenager, think I was Rambo, and you know, crawl around <laughs> through the through the woods with a with a bow and arrow. But I never got anything because I was just like a buffalo stomping through the through the jungle. Uh, so that's, I never. That's, that sounds years, like I never me. Got I, was a, I was like that. I think I was just, <laughs> that's all I heard from my dad all the time. Was quiet, quiet. You're too loud. But that was me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's come back to uh to barbecue competitions. You mentioned uh, uh yep. Adam Omasaw there, top guy, Wizards of yep. Q, fantastic team. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, s- some more great yeah. results out of them. Um, so that was actually we, we were just talking off air before we started. I thought it was Kangaroo Valley, but you corrected me. It was actually Port Mac, 2017. Yes. So that was five years ago that we first met. That's right. Yeah. So we competed there yeah, um and as as a group called HDD Barbecue at Sydney Meatstock. And it was just four guys that went, oh, we can do this, that, you know, from the Hills area of Sydney. And, um, yeah, it was we, from first on, we, we loved this. And then we sort of went, okay, let's change our name. We, you went to Port Mac. And that's just where I met most of the people around, you know. I actually had about a chat to them and actually knew people and met yourself and some of the, the big names in barbecue that, you know, that just that I still look up to and go, wow, how do you do what you do? Yeah, right. And so were you were you bitten by the barbecue competition bug then? Were you just sort of Massive. all about competitions yeah. for a while? It was all competitions. It was like like we literally left meat stock and went, This is amazing, when's the next one? What can we do? And it was just <laughs> um a money pit, really. The amount of things we did and try to do and the the biggest thing was like it was like how much practice you do and how much meat you go through just in practicing and trying to get, you know, because I'm one of those guys that's if I'm not gonna do it 100% I don't want to do it. Like, I'm just, I'm never going to put that half assed effort in. It's just not going to happen. Um, so, like, I was competing, like, I was, I was practicing, you know, briskets. And, like, you can't practice on a cheap brisket. You've got to practice on what you're doing. And we were using WX9s back then. That cool. I was getting a good price on them, but they were not cheap. They were not cheap at all. And once it, like, I can't take them home and eat them because my wife doesn't eat them, you know? So, it was just getting rid of them to three people. Um, yeah. And then, like Adams has taken it to another level since I sort of dropped out because went to the restaurant, the restaurant opened up and I'm like, I can't really give you the time that I'm doing it. And he's just taken it to another level the way he competes. So. Yeah. He's, uh, he's uh, pulling trophies left, right and center. Now, anytime you see the name wizards of Q on the, on the uh, competition team list, you know, they're going to be pulling a trophy there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. He's just, yeah. yeah. So I sort of, that's where I get disappointed. Sorry, as I get this one, I see the name pop up. I, I, I watch a, a presentation, I should be there, you know? Like, I feel like I should, I'm missing out for not being there. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, the FOMO sort of stings a bit. Yes. Yeah. So tell me, what what would be your, your favourite competition experience that you've had? Uh, I can't go past meat stock just for, you know, 50 teams there and that as soon as it shuts down at a night to the public and it's just the teams and like that. Um, is probably the best one that I've enjoyed um, for that sort of side. Uh, Kangaroo Valley, though, is one of those pumps. It's just, you can't say no to it. Like um, Matt Harris, just, you know, everyone comes in, does food, does this, someone has pizzas, someone has this, they drink this. It's just, that's really like, not even a comp the way you go there. It's just like everyone sort of, you just end up in one spot and it's just, like you're not trying to, it doesn't feel like you're trying to beat everybody. Like it's, it doesn't feel as competitive, even though it is. It's just, yeah, one of those comps there. Uh, and so Matt Harris does amazing. Like, I know he doesn't run the comp. Sometimes it feels like he does down there. And he brings that Devon onto it. And, um, <laughs> yeah. Yes. The, uh, the, the, Devon, the is, Devon side comp gets a bit wild sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah, I judge it a couple of times because I don't like to compete in that one. And some of the things you've got to eat is, yeah. <laughs> I don't like that one too much. Not, not, not judging it, but. Um, but yeah, that, that was probably my best family comp. Just that's what it feels like. Um, and I only did the one Port Macquarie, which was just an eye opener um, because that was the first year we went as a comp. And then the next year I was at the restaurant. I just couldn't really get away and do it. I just couldn't do it. Um, and that was our first walk. Uh, somehow we snagged the brisket walk at Port Mac, and I still don't really know how we did it. But yeah, but yeah, for me the one comp still means stuff. Just. You can't beat it. Your whole experience, the whole weekend. Yeah, meat stock is definitely uh, 
definitely one of the highlights of the calendar, isn't it? So tell me, yeah. um, what are your future plans regarding competitions? I know you haven't been in one for a while because of the, the restaurant's been so busy and we're going to get to the restaurant in the next section. But um, what are your plans for competition barbecue in the future? Are we going to see a return of fire and brimstone to the comp scene? Uh, it is the plan. Um, I sort of, at the start of this year, sort of sat down with you know, sort of what comp's going to be around and what I can do. Um, so probably not this year. Uh, I think it's just too many things trying to expand the restaurant, expand menus. I'm just not really going to have the, the time to put in to make it worthwhile. Like, I don't want to go there and just make up a number. Um, so if I end up at a comp this year and help me help, I'll try, I'll try and slot myself in with Adam uh, and give him a hand. But that's probably it to be honest, this year. Uh, and then hopefully next year I'm in a stage where I can go, yep, sweet, I've got things running, I can leave it properly and, and get away and actually have a real hot go at it. Mate, I, I certainly uh, cross my fingers and hope to see you back out there on the circuit. Look, we're going to take a little break and we'll be right back. Hey, family, uh, the winter is coming. How do you like that for an original line? I just thought of that on the spot there. Winter is coming. So uh, not that you'd know it on the Gold Coast today because it's pretty warm and sweaty here in the studio right now. But ne- nevertheless, winter is coming and we do have some fantastic winter merch available for you at smokinghotconfessions.com slash shop. We have our hoodies available that have got our Hail Mary design on the back, uh, awarded Best Barbecue Apparel 2021 at the NBBQA conference over in the United States. It's, so it's literally award-winning uh, barbecue merch. She's also on our T-shirts. We do have T-shirts there as well if you're in Queensland and it's, you know, winter time, so you've got to put a T-shirt on instead of just a singlet. So we've got some T-shirts there for the Queenslanders. We've also got our beanies there with our beautiful 3D stitching across the top there as well. And we do have our tumblers, which will keep a cup of coffee hot overnight. So if you are... Uh, are getting ready for the winter months and you're not looking forward to spending the wee hours of the morning out by the fire pit uh, freezing your butt off, you can grab yourself some of this beautiful merch and stay nice and warm. Got a project you'd like to work on with the SHC team? Shoot Ben an email on ben at smokinghotconfessions.com and let's have a conversation. Alrighty, Brad. So now let's get into the uh, into the business side of things. Fire and brimstone. Yep. You got restaurants. You got rubs. You got food trucks, mate. Which came first? So the the restaurant came first. Um, so you yeah, just started so like up, you yeah. just went all in from the start. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, the, the restaurant was the spot was here, and um, I'm inside the Hillside Hotel here at Castle Hill, and they're like, "Look, let's just do it," and yeah, so I'm like, let's do it, give it a go, give it, a, you know, give it six months, see what I can actually do out of it, and it just get going and going, and, you know, like, just, yeah, it's hard to explain on, it's gone four years now, like, it's just, yeah, so it took off that fast, the restaurant got busy, it was just selling out all the time, and that's what I was trying to start off with, you know, that whole American barbecue, you've got to, sell, like, you sell out, you sell out, um, but the problem with me is, I'm inside a pub, so, like, I'm on the second level. So, the bottom level's got a bistro. So, they do the normal pub classics and things like that. I'm upstairs with the barbecue. I'm open till 9 o'clock at night. And that's what we're advertised. Or, you know, till late, sold out. And when I was selling out, I had people come up and go, oh, we sold out. And, you know, like, the whole Australian crowd don't really understand it still compared to other places. Like, you know, everyone in America can understand it. And the, the boss of the pub was just like, look, we're going to stop selling out. Like, We've got to have, like, we want people coming in. We don't want them to turn them away. Um, so, like, yep, yeah, all right. So, straight away, I had to start cooking more because, you know, but then I had to find somewhere to get rid of the extra, bit, you know, like, profits. And, and that was the hard part. And straight away, go, okay, what am I going to do with this? So, we looked into a few different models and, yeah, and now I don't run out. I can't remember the last time we were open and we didn't have, like, brisket or, like, the, the staples. Um, I still will run out of short ribs or pork ribs or some of the other things we're running on as our specials. But as a whole, the majority of the menu is available all the time. So if I'm open, it's available. Um, which is good for that fact. Like I have people walking, like I'm open to nine o'clock tonight. There'll be I'll have people walking at five to nine and go, yep, yeah, cool, I want brisket, I want pork, I want this. And you know, I hate saying no to people. So yeah. So yeah, trying to get rid of it was interesting, but like I, I, I've got a couple of dishes on the bistro menu downstairs. So I've got a fire and brimstone pizza. So any excess brisket, like I'll, I'll cool down and it goes onto a pizza or the hot link sausage, things like that. Um, yeah, and just stuff like that. Got, that got rid of most of it. So. 
Yeah, right. That's some good strategies there. Now, I've got to ask a quick question. You mentioned a 60-hour job there before the break. Do you, you, you don't still have a 60-hour job on top of the restaurant? No, not on top of the restaurant. No. The restaurant can be like that, or if not more. But oh, yeah, sure, that sure. was before. That's what, when we were catering. So like I was the operations manager of a car rental company. So it was just, you know, long hours, long days. No nights though, luckily, but it was all weekends. So um, yeah, so I used to cook all my catering and stuff like that outside that place. And that was, yeah, so... I do less hours than most of the time now in the restaurant, but it doesn't feel like it sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, another thing that, that you did mention before the, the break was that the first six months were incredibly hard. And I think that there's a lot of us out there who sort of fantasize about owning our own barbecue joint, uh, um, owning our own barbecue restaurant. And we sort of don't fully appreciate just how hard it is to get a barbecue joint up off the ground. Can you can you tell us about those uh, that that first sort of six to twelve months and just how hard it was and exactly what you had to do to be able to make it all work? Yeah. So for me, like we're only open when I first started, like three days a week. So and only nights, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, and you know, yeah, sweet, I'm going to work three days. But like those days, I'd be here at six thirty in the morning. Like I'd work when, like I pretty much have Monday off or Tuesday, but like Wednesday, you're trying to prep stuff. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I'm here at 6.30, 7 in the morning, for cooking, and the restaurant closed at 9 that night, but, you know, after you close, you've still got to, you've got to clean, you've got to do everything else. Sometimes I wouldn't leave till 11.30, midnight, so go home, you know, I'm half an hour drive from the restaurant, go home, have a shower, get dressed, like, sleep, come back, you know, you're getting five hours sleep tops, and there are days, like, you don't sit down. Like I, I do 16, 17 hour days. I don't remember sitting down. Like you, you eat between when you can. It's yeah. I went from an office job really to doing you know 20, 25,000 steps a day, just up and down stairs. It's you know, and it's hot. You know, you, you I've got a fire and you're under a smoker. It's there's no air conditioning. It's and you know I'd only been here about a month and I hurt my ankle and I had every test under the sun trying to work out what was wrong. And no one could find anything. They put me in a moon boot because I, I couldn't walk. Um, but I couldn't stop because I was the only one cooking, I was the only one serving. So a, if I wasn't here, the restaurant wasn't open. So I spent four months in a moon boot doing those sort of days still. Um, like I, my physio, I've got a mate who's a physio, and he kept getting the boots for me. I, I wore the tread off two moon boots where it went completely smooth. And he's like, I've never seen no one do that. I did it twice. And then I'm like, I've got to get out of it. So pretty much what they said, you have to take um, you know, two or three weeks off and not walk to get here. I'm like, I can't do that. So that's what we did. We just, you battle on and you got to do it. Like no one's going to do it for you. Um, and being in food, margins are so razor thin. You just can't, like you can't just give it to someone else and do it. You're never going to make any money. Like there's no, there's, if you're going to make a mistake and you know, something you throw out, thousand dollars with the meat well you're just not going to make any money for a while so um yeah it, it was tough like i have plenty of people ask me going i'm going to do this i'm going to do that and i'm like yeah it's fun but if you really want to make it your job it's it's you, you've got to work it's not gonna you know and cooking one brisket a week two brisket a week to cooking 10 15 a day plus this plus that and having it ready like i i i, I service to me is like a pump where you've got to have everything ready then you know you if you're late, people aren't going to wait. So that was, yeah, that's where my comp sort of helped me at the, right, at the start of the, the restaurant. But uh, yeah, if you people want to do it, yeah, if you really want to, you, you think you're going to enjoy it and you've got plenty of money behind you to do it because you're going to bleed cash for a long time, um, it's it's not going to be the easy job you've had, I can guarantee that. Yeah, yeah. Now you mentioned the the razor thin margins there, and you had mentioned before that balancing uh, wastage and profit was a big problem. How have you? How have you? Uh, what sort of systems have you come up to come up with to solve that? Yeah, so I'm lucky being sort of in this pub, and I've got the the group that can sort of help me with suppliers. So, um, like if, you know, most suppliers in the in the food industry, unless you're talking big numbers, are just you know, that's the price, bad luck. Um, but because I'm sort of part of this group, so like, you know, like there's what about five venues now and 
um, you know, there's two or three restaurants in most of these places. Like you, we're talking, I can sort of piggyback off those accounts and go, look, I need this, this, and this, and I can't, I don't want to pay that price, you know. So you've got a little bit of negotiating power, which, which said it helps a lot. But you know, over the last six months, meat meat has gone up unbelievably fast, and it just, you know, like I've, like things like short ribs have gone up 50, 60 percent uh, wholesale for me. That you just you can't afford to put them on the menu sometimes. It's just, because if like if I have say say I put on ten racks of short ribs and I don't sell one, I might as well not cook the other nine because the money's gone. Um, yeah, and then like wastage and things like that, and just making sure you're pricing things properly. That was my big eye open up for food that you pay. Say you buy a brisket fifteen bucks a kilo at eight kilos. The time you cook it, it's only four and a half. And if you still think of that fifteen bucks a kilo, then it's not. It's twenty five, twenty six a kilo now, and trying to work those ways around and then trying not to have wastage too. So like I make tallow. So all my brisket trim, all the meat, all the fat, I make tallow, which goes in like, I've always got heaps of here. I use it, for, you know, I make candles, I make soap. Yeah, edible candles are pretty cool that I've done with those. Edible um, candles. And then, yeah, so you make this uh, put some flavors through the fat and you know, it goes hard and you put a wick in it and uh, light it up and you can eat it, eat it like an oil. So I've done um where you get like bread, like you, know, you go to an Italian restaurant and they give you olive oil and things like that with the bread to eat. Yeah. It's a similar similar idea to that. So um light the wick and down it becomes a liquid and stick your bread in and eat it. Oh, okay. All right. That makes a lot of sense. I couldn't work out where that was going <laughs> with, with, with edible canvas. Yeah. I was like I was yeah. just trying to picture like you're going to light one end and then eat it from the other like a cigar or something yeah, like that. That, <laughs> that that could be an interesting idea maybe see if we can do something like that but yeah so things like that uh and then finding uh an outlet for stuff that's not sold so i've got in sydney there's two um pizza shops uh in the hills uh that buy a lot of brisket and uh they do uh, my brisket and pulled pork on two of their most popular pizzas Oh. Um, so they, you know, well, I actually, they take more than my excess every day. Like it's, I have to cook for them to keep up. Uh, and then I've got, um, the, the bistro downstairs and then we've just opened another pizza place, uh, on the bottom level on the road and it, it opens up fully live tomorrow actually. Um, and they're going to take a lot of brisket and pork and sausage, um, for their pizza menu. So, you know, it's always about trying to utilize the smoker really, you know, the things I can do differently that, you know, these places sometimes can't get a hold of these products. So I'm like, yep, well, I've got excess of this, this, and this. I can sell it to you for this, this, and this, and that way I'm not losing money. Okay. So it's more of like a, like a, you got to have a better overview of the entire supply chain, really. It's not just yes. you and you and your bit. You've got to look at what happens before and what happens after as well. Yeah. And see like the, the pizza shop at, at Borkham Hills here, um, I've known him online and I went and saw him and he's, he was buying smoked brisket from a wholesaler and paying big money for it. And I sort of, I saw it and tasted it. I'm like, this is pretty average. Hey, like this is like flavor wise for, for, for smoked brisket. I'm like, this is no good. Like it was pretty much just a massive wholesaler who does them on time in a smoke right oven. And it's not to like cooked. It's like, okay, this much hour, this temperature, it's done. And sometimes mm. it's good, sometimes it's not. So I went and saw him. I go, look, I can do it for this. Like my price, is a lot more expensive. Um, but then he took one batch and he went, yeah, cool. Awesome. And that and literally swapped the next week because he's like, I can see the value in it. I'm going to spend more money, but I get a better product. So yeah, he's not a massive business, and he's like more interested in the quality of the product coming out. So it worked well for both of us. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a fantastic solution. I I love that. Now I I was uh, sort of flicking through your your website and your socials and stuff, and I saw something. Um, that it concerned me a little bit. Um, bottomless barbecue and beer. Given the clientele <laughs> being being barbecue fans, yeah. that's very brave of you. Yeah. So it's something we started. Um, oh, oh, it was. I think it was just before the first lockdown. Um, and we're let's do, let's do a Friday night, or you can eat barbecue and see how it goes. I'm like, all right. The first one was blew me away. Like it was just, we had 70, 80 people rock up that I was not expecting. And sure enough, I, I, I got through that night service just, um, and I'm like, I was on the edge of the pants of I'm going to run out of food. And what am I going to do with these people who said that? And so this went instantly. People were done. 
And so we just kept doing it. And like I do it now, Friday night, Saturday night, from five o'clock all the way through. So you can do all you can eat food. Uh, and now we've got the, the beer add-on as well. So, uh, you know, last night we had about 55 people through and about half that do the beer add-on as well. And yeah, like we have a set up, it's table service. Um, so there's a, we have a couple of girls running around the front and all they do is run food back and forth for you. So you don't even get out of your chair. It's, um, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> Well, I know where I'm going to go eat next time I go to Sydney. Yeah. And everyone's like, I'm going to eat you out of food. They come up straight away because I set up my station out near the smoker. So I've got the little offshoot of the, off, uh, offshoot of the kitchen. So the kitchen will handle the main menu items where I set myself off. Uh, I've got a big steak fire pit. So I took steaks out there to order on the fire pit and I run the bottom of the section from there. So I've got everything out there um, just to try and keep, you know, otherwise the kitchen will get overrun and, you know, you can't. You can't put that food fast enough. So uh, set up there. So everyone comes up like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, you're going to run out of food. And I'm like, it's not going to happen. It doesn't matter what, you know, you just, I've got that much that you're never going to, um, but everyone tries, you know. Oh, of course, of course. And is there a price? Uh, so we do that for $47 a head for the food. Uh, and that comes with brisket, pork, uh, chicken wings, mac and cheese, my barbecue pit beans, slaw, potato salad, pickles, bread rolls fries and my barbecue pizza and they just come out literally go like and you know like i've went to some places before where like okay you've got to eat everything on your plate and you, i'll give you a selection back like we don't do that here so um we got to the table and there's you know you've out of brisket you want more brisket more brisket comes this you know you only want wings and you want you only want brisket you, can't have, you don't have to have everything yeah um you know i, I want to do less wastage so if you don't if you're not going to eat the chicken wings Tell me, and I won't put them on the plate. Like that's not a worry at all. So that person, I know, they just run back and forth, and that, and then uh, we do. I think it's thirty-two dollars add-on for the beers, um, and there's about six or eight beers that just for the next two hours. So you got two hours to do it too. So it's not like we rush you in and out. No. Um, and people always worry before, like, am I going to eat enough in two hours? Like you can't eat for two hours anymore. Like an hour, if you're going hard, you ain't eat more than an hour. Um, no. So it's. Yeah. And then where I'm sitting, do I sit right at the edge of the restaurant when you walk in or where you walk out? So everyone walks out and they can see me right there. And it's just, you can see the smile on their face like how much food they've eaten. You know, they just about to roll out some nights. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Look, that's, that's got to be a great feeling being able to see them uh, sort of come and go from where you are. Now, you were mentioning before, and I was actually going to ask if you smoked on or off site because your, your kitchen is in part of a larger complex there. Um, but you no. were saying that, that you are on site. Did I'm you? on site. So, yeah. Yep. So when you're ordering, you know, at the till, to your right, you can nearly touch it. That's how close it is, is the offset. So, like, it's, it's not hidden. It's on full view. And that was done on purpose that, you know, you walk in, you can see it straight away. Um, I've been to different restaurants over the years and they've said there's smoked meats. And, you know, yep, you, you walk in. First thing I look for is I want to see the smoke. I want to see what it doesn't no matter what it is. And if I can't see it, I'm like, well, where is it? Like, what is it? You know, like I've, I've seen pubs that do, you know, literally it's like, they call it a smoke right, just an upright oven. It's got smoke chips in the bottom. And yeah, it's smoked meats, but is it it's not the same? No, it's not real barbecue. Um, so I look no. for it. No. So you can see it. Like I was out there today, only a couple of hours ago when I was wrapping all the briskets and stuff like that. And I've got customers who are, they can see me. So they come over and, you know, they're, they're a meter, meter and a half from the smoker. And they can see what exactly what I'm doing. The briskets and wrapping this and I'm taking this off. And, uh, it's all about experiences. So like the pub I'm in is owned by the Memento Hospitality Group. And one of their whole lines is creating, like bringing people together to create memories. And that's exactly what the smoker does for me. Like it's, it's a talking point and I love talking about barbecue. So it works really well for me. Yeah, yeah. Now there's, I've, I've got something in the back of my memory. Did you build the smoker that you and Adam were cooking on when I first met you at um, Port Mac? And therefore, did you, build the smoker that you're cooking on now at the restaurant so no so port mac uh i'd actually bought a smoking jack so i just bought it um i had a bright yellow one um and we had that and that's what we cooked on there and then adam him and stefan they built the 30 inch offset they use now so they built that on the trailer um but for me uh mine's a mine smoker's made by i think now Angry Beard Smokers here in Sydney. 
So oh, right. they built one. So it's, so it's not round. It's sort of hexagonal, sort of square shape. Um, nothing's round about it. Um, and it's different, but I love it. Like it looks, it's just yeah, like every pit, everything's different on it, you know. So it took a bit of a while getting used to, but um, I can feel a lot of meat on it. So that's the best thing about it. Yeah, I think I met those guys when they came up to Burley once. Yeah, amazing guys. I don't think they do it anymore, actually. They're from in Sydney here, but I'm pretty sure they don't make smokers anymore. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah, so uh, I still see them every now and then. Like, they'll pop up to the restaurant and things like that. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, one more thing before we move on. I understand that you guys came up with a pretty, uh, a pretty novel solution to the whole, uh, you know, restaurant closures over the last couple of years. Can you give us a bit of a bit of a talk on the solution that you came up with? That obviously you're still open today. So, tell us about how you solved yeah. the the lockdowns. Yeah. So with that first lockdown that hit Sydney, um, as I said we're part of that group. We had a few, quite a few venues that were closed and a lot of staff and things like that, but. We had that, no one could buy toilet paper, no one could buy this, no one could buy that. Um, and then sort of brainchild come up and we had this warehouse at Bella Vista off, off side of the Bella Vista Hotel. There was just, you know, a massive car park really, but it's all inside. So very quickly they got turned into what they call Bella, Bella Vista Essentials Express. And this turned into a drive-thru. Um, so literally people could come in, order off your phone and buy the things that we had. Like we had, we had excess of everything because you know, had it all, and including alcohol. So very quickly, they went, yeah, we're going to do this. So we did like pizza bases, like because we had the big wood fire pizza to make pizza bases, uh, toilet paper, alcohol, which created a shake and serve cocktail. So we did one liter, liter, one liter cocktails, take home. And barbecue was pretty much where we started. It went, yep, uh, Marcello, one of the, the owners of the hospitality group, he was like, oh, Brad, I want to have brisket, pulled pork, chicken wings, cooked, sliced, back sealed, ready to take home and cook. Can we do it? And within a couple of days, it was sorted. And yeah, it just went ballistic. Like, because never wanted to get out of the home and you couldn't go anywhere, you couldn't buy anything. We had cars lined up, like, for, you know, a kilometer trying to get in. And it was super fast. Like, you didn't get any car, all QR code. And then from there, it was like, what else can we sell? And pretty much, if it wasn't bolted down at one of these venues, it got sold. So. <laughs> Um, like they were selling furniture, you know, people were buying this and people were buying that and you name it, we got rid of it. And it was just really good because it kept a lot of people in work. Like I would have had to shut down nothing. There would have been, you know, nowhere to cook. Um, but I kept on people cooking. We were cooking more for that than I ever did for the restaurant. Like if the, my smoker was running full all day, every day, wow. um, we would, I, I'd have one, like a couple of people. You, you spend an eight, 10 hour shift and all you're doing is slicing brisket, back sealing it. That's all you're doing to try and keep up and it'd be sold within a couple of hours the next day, it's all gone. Um, so that was good. And then we were at the group and then very quickly after that, we went, oh, let's try and do, we got an offsite, like the next building over from that Bellevue Hotel, we had a, uh, a building with a big car park and we turned that into Food Truck Express. So we had 10 food trucks, uh, all selling something different. And same setup, drive through, QR code on your phone, order from those, pay over your phone, no cash. And then we had staff from all these venues who needed work and they'd run from the car. They'd take your order, like from the computer, run to the truck, get your food, take it back to your car and out you drive. And we were doing five, 600 cars a night just through there, um, a few nights a week. So that was good to keep staff in all these venues in jobs, but also some of these trucks that, you know, they couldn't work because there was nothing going on. Um, so we set it up for them and yeah, it was amazing. And I've met some, some really amazing people in the food truck industry from that. Cause I've got, so I've got a food truck as well. Um, that sort of runs when I can it, like when I'm, when I'm not too busy and I've got an event, um, but sometimes it's pretty hard, but I was there every night and, um, yeah, so it was just, you know, food trucks are like, for me, it was like barbecue. Everyone was just, they're all, you know, your friends and family from that as well. Yeah, beautiful, man. That's a great solution to uh, to what was one hell of a problem. And are you still running those yeah. those uh, roadside um, uh, express lane things on like at, as well as the restaurant, or have you found that everyone was more than happy to come back into the restaurant again? Yeah. So once the restaurants reopened, um, it was a straight back to that pretty much. The, it just they, the whole idea of that 
food like drive throughs did a really work thing because people could come and get it and they want to eat out. Like, especially after the last lockdown, it, the, the amount of people coming back into venue was so fast. Um, it was like, we'll close one week and then we're back to normal again next week. It was just, uh, it, was, it was weird to see because it happened so fast. Um, and that's just what's happened now that pretty much now, yeah, my food truck at the moment is parked and I just, I'm going to look at it lately because I just, I can't keep up with what we're doing now. Let alone do the food truck as well. Well, mate, that's a, that's a great uh, sort of ending and sort of catching us up to where you are now. I'm really happy to hear that, uh, that the things are going well for you. We are going to take just a short break and then we will be right back. I just want to take this opportunity to give a big shout out to everybody that's joining us live in the Facebook community online today, the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Community. That's the location where we record these episodes live, such as we are with Brad today. Now, we are going to be jumping into the third segment shortly, so now's the time to start punching your questions into the comments. And if you are not in the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Community yet, make sure you come over and join. It's the friendliest little corner of the internet. It's family friendly. It's good, clean, barbecue-related fun. All the other guff is left at the door and we'd love to have you there. So if you're not there yet, we'll see you soon. You're listening to the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with massive barbecue nerd, Ben Arnott. Okay, Brad, this is the part of the show now where our guest gets to share some wisdom, share... But basically, give a bit of a lesson for all the for all the listeners and the viewers. And you've told me today that you've got some tips and tricks for better barbecue that you want to share. So I'm going to zip my lips, if you can believe that, and uh, I'm going to just take some notes and hand it over to you. Yep, no worries at all. Yeah. So this is honestly the best part of my job. I love talking to people about barbecue. Uh, I host a masterclass up here every month, um, trying to help people, you know, become better at barbecue. Because you know, back in the day when I learned, it was all YouTube, it was all American, and you know, some things you just, you can't get from that. So uh, little things I try and, my little tips and tricks, uh, mainly based on brisket because everything sort of, for me, works around that one. That's the one I get asked the most is feel. There's nothing more important to me. That's the one trick, one trick I do is with brisket, um, I go on feel. So there's not a magic time. There's not a magic temperature. Um, there's guides that it's all about feel. And that's a big part of my class is, you know, I get a brisket that's ready done and go, look, this is what it's got to feel like. So the look on people's eyes and they go, ah, oh, you know, it heard of it, you know, soft butter, you know, push a skewer through it. That's what it should feel like. Um, but when they actually get to feel it. So, yeah. So that's my number one trick, uh, tip, sorry, is um, go, everything on barbecue is about feel for me uh, and time. So with time, uh, the first thing I say in my master class every week, every time is work out roughly what it should take, so a brisket, 8, 10, 12 hours, and give yourself a three-hour head start. Uh, Worst case scenario is it finishes early. A longer rest, great. What's wrong with that? Uh, If something goes wrong, you've got a three-hour buffer now to try and catch up Um, because it's got to be ready when it's ready, and there's nothing worse than dinner time comes around, everyone's like, where is it, where is it, where is it? You'll get either frustrated and taken off early, and if anyone's ever had undercooked barbecue, it's not good. Um, undercooked brisket is just yeah, it's bad. terrible. <laughs> um, so give yourself that buffer because this is the worst case scenario is it's you got a three hour rest, and um, some of the best brisket I've ever cooked had had a lot longer rest than, than that. So yeah, just three hours extra time and cook by feel. They're my my number one tips on just about everything. So. Yeah, nice. So when you say cook by feel, can you just explain that idea a little bit more? What are you feeling for? What what are you, uh, what's the um, end goal there? So, yeah, with brisket, it's, you know, like uh, I said before, undercooked brisket is tough, it's dry. So if you probe it, you know, like I, I use a thermos in the restaurant, um, but I'm more looking at, I'm trying to have a feel how it goes into the brisket when I'm, when I'm testing if it's ready more than the temperature. Um, so, like, when you know, when you've done it once, you sort of feel that brisket, you push it in, you go, there's no resistance, it's soft, it's wiggly. Um, that's when it's done, irrespective of what the time is, uh, what, sorry, what the temperature is. So it's like when people go, they cook a steak and they sort of touch it and they can feel it and go, yep, cool, that's medium, that's medium rare. Um, just being said, I don't do that with my steaks, it doesn't work for me. But um, yeah, so when that brisk is done and you can feel it, you can touch it, you wiggle it, you slap it, whatever you do, you watch those videos, that's when it's done. Um, so don't take it off before then. So it's, it's a hard 
concept to grasp unless you're actually doing it, uh, which is what I find from when I'm teaching people. That, you know, they sort of, they experience it and go, yes, that's, now I know. And then that just elevates your game straight away. Um, and then what's, and then overcook it if you have to, because overcooked, overcooked barbecue is always better than under. Yeah, it's always better to be uh, falling apart always. rather than uh, yeah. than uh, chewing for 15 minutes on on one mouthful. Yeah, and that's it because, yeah, people, people oh, sorry, yeah, people come up and they go, yeah, if I cook this brisket, I must cook it too long because it's dry. I'm like, yeah, complete opposite. And uh, that's that's a really hard for people to, to understand, so. Yeah, I did some uh, some ribs last night and I never once even used a probe. I was using my yeah. uh, I, I was using my eyes to judge color, and then just sort of picking yep. the picking the rack of ribs up of pork ribs up, and just sort of feeling them feeling the flex and going, yep, yep, we're there. That's right, and that's that's only experience to get you there. So, you know, I do remember that when I was up on the Gold Coast because my mum was on the Gold Coast, not far from you. And um, a few years ago, I was up there and um, uh, I got I got Lena Weber and no pros, no nothing, cooked lamb for dinner. And uh, even my mum was looking at me like, how do you know it's ready? I'm like, it's, it is. I can touch it. You know, it's soft. It's, that's it. And they'll look at me going, this doesn't fill me with a lot of confidence, but they had it and they, you know, they believe me now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, a lot of the best pit masters out there tell you that they just use a toothpick. Yeah. Well, that's what I use a the thermopen as a skewer. I, I'm, not, I'm not really looking to see, you know, unless I'm cooking something that I know has to be to a certain time, like chicken or something, you know, you don't want to serve undercooked chicken. Of course. Um, but as a whole, the thermopen is just going in and out. I'm only feeling for it. Like I don't, I don't really look at the temperature. No, no. All right, we've, we've got a question come in here. And uh, from Facebook over here, I can see that it's come from Tom Clark. And the question is, uh, hey, what's Tom? Brad's preferred rest method for serving it the way it was intended? Oh, okay, yeah. So in the restaurant, at home, everything. So when a brisket's finished for me, I, I stick with brisket. It comes off the pit. I've got a rack right beside the smoker that everything will go into um and it sits there for an hour i don't i wrap in butcher's paper and i use gastro trays because in the in the kitchen it's so much easier that everything moves around and slides in and out but it sits there for an hour a bit of it um and that's outside you know like it's not under the elements but that's it uh and from then uh i use a hot box in the restaurant so i'll put that straight in a hot box it sits at 62 degrees so just above food safety and that's it. But for me, if I was doing it at home, there's no hot box, I'd take that out, sit on the bench for an hour on top of the oven, just completely exposed. So I leave the butcher paper wrapped, but that's it. Let it cool down a little bit. Uh, and if I've got to go longer then, yeah, wrap that in a towel, put it in an esky, and it'll hold hot for hours. Um, but yeah, so definitely let that time to, to vent out that heat before you wrap it or, and, or cut into it. Don't cut into it for that hour because it needs to rest. Definitely, definitely. Well, look, that's probably a good place for us to start to, uh, to, to, to wrap up this episode. So I'm going to throw the studio over to you now. Give some thanks, give some praise, give some shout-outs to people that have helped you out along the way and tell everybody where they can track you down on the interwebs. No worries. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, yeah, so thank you mainly to my family here in Sydney, like my wife, just to, to give me this chance to, to try and do this and, and still be there. So uh, her and my family. Um, in the industry here, I mean now, so like getting in barbecue, like I wouldn't be worried with the people like Adam, um, because we bounce so much stuff each other. Um, and we talk barbecue every single day, pretty much. Uh, and then some of the other, the guys in the barbecue world that I look up to and chat to, you know, and there's a few in Melbourne, a few around, uh, like I chat to Kit down there at Houston a fair bit. He's um, pumping out some amazing barbecue, but I couldn't even list them all in there. Um, and in the, in the pubs I'm in now, so there's a couple of chefs that are around that sort of I bounce ideas off because I'm not a chef by trade, you know, this is my first kitchen job. So, you know, some of the things I learned from them. Um, find me, so I'm on all the socials uh, mainly, so Facebook, Instagram, the main ones. I do have a TikTok account, but I don't really post on it because I seem to be too old for that place. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the restaurant itself, I'm um, based in, the, in uh, Castle Hill in uh, Western Sydney. So I'm on the rooftop of the Hillside Hotel. Uh, we've got a bourbon bar up here, live music, you know, big screen. Home of the UFC in Sydney, like we're pumped. So if you don't watch UFC, you're in the area. There's no other place to be. Um, yeah, 
that's me. Um, check me out online. I've got, I said, dental I've got my range of rubs and sources. Got a few more sources coming through very soon, hopefully. This is the final stage of getting them bottled up. Um, you sent anywhere in Australia. I think you've, you've tried them, Ben, I think. So they've done all right. They are very good, mate. Very good. All yeah, right, that's, well, that's pretty much for me. Yeah, great. Well, look, mate, thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate you. Uh, appreciate you coming on board. And uh, best of luck with it all in the future. No worries at all, mate. And uh, catch up with you in Toowoomba. You betcha. Done. Thank you. And there you have it, family. That was uh, Brad Shorten from Fire and Brimstone Barbecue. What a fascinating story there for how they were able to keep the wheels rolling during the uh, during the lockdowns and the various restaurant closures and all that sort of stuff as well. Um, really inspiring to hear how they sort of, you know, pulled their resources, uh, got their heads together and came up with a solution that worked for their, for their whole uh, sort of uh, restaurant community there. Great story and it was really great to have him on board. Now, before I let you go, just a quick, uh, a, a quick ask for on, on my behalf. If you could just take a quick second and just give us a little like and a share. The sign says it all here behind me, like, share and sub. And if you are actually listening to this later on on Spotify, Spotify now for 2022 has a brand new feature where you can do ratings. So if you could just take two seconds, tap the five-star button for us there on the Spotify app. I'd really appreciate that. That would really help us out. And that is all the time that we have for today. So until next time, take care of each other and keep on queuing. Thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips, and Ben's own confessions. <laughs>